Um, this is Xtalks Digital Discourses. It's sponsored by the Office of Digital Learning. My name is Molly Ruggles and I coordinate the series. Um, we are thrilled today to have four digital learning scientists with us to talk about their work in blended learning. Four of them in the same room at the same time. It's, it's pretty cool. This is, may I introduce you to Dr. Simona Sakrat, Dr. Saif Ryan, Dr. Mary Allen Wiltrout, and Dr. Jessica Sandlin. And you're going to hear from each one of them about their work. Um, a few housekeeping just announcements. Um, we're filming today, so if you don't want to be in the film, just sit in the last row if you don't want to be in the video. We're also, we have great amplification in the room, but in order to get a high quality video, I'm talking into this microphone. These folks will as well, and when we do q and I'm going to ask you to talk into the mic so we get a good quality video for later. Um, this is our last X Talks for the moment, but there's more coming, but percolating, and if you're not on the mailing list, send email there and you'll get on. Um, what else do I need to say? I'm going to be passing around a clipboard. We, we really like to know who's here, who you are, what you're interested in, so we can better serve you. Um, I think that's pretty much it for now. Um, so we'll start today with um, Simone. So please join me in a very warm welcome to Dr. Simone Sakrat. <laughs> I like this that I get, I get the clapping before I even say anything. <laughs> I'm just I'm done. <laughs> That's cool. Um, so we figured that the first thing we should do is uh, uh, tell you who we are, why we are here together. Uh, we are all members of the MIT uh, Office of Digital, the Digital Learning Lab, which is a cooperative um, effort between the Office of Digital Learning and our MIT Academics Department. So we are all on the teaching staff of our own academic departments. I'm in Mechanical Engineering, Saif is in Physics, Maria Allen in Biology, and Jessica in Material Science. And we are together because we are all interested in both using and developing uh, digital learning tools and to be used both in uh, our um, residential courses and for the online community of learners, uh, OpenCourseWare, edX. Um, so essentially, we are a group of practitioners that come together to share our experience, uh, to figure out what worked and what didn't work in the things we did, uh, to share our latest and greatest uh, digital tool, and uh, discuss technical implementations, and see what worked, what didn't work, and essentially bring back our knowledge to our own departments. Because one of our important tasks is to work as a liaison between the Office of Digital Learning and our academic departments, and work with other faculties in the department to help them develop and implement digital tools uh, in their classes to use both for the residential courses and to then bring these courses to the online learning community through MOOCs that are offered through edX. Uh, so that's who you are, we are. It's about 15 uh, scientists in the lab. Uh, there are five senior scientists. Four of us are here. And there is one more senior scientist, which is Jennifer French in mathematics. And she's going to give her own talk because she's I want to be a part <laughs> in the spring, because she has more stuff to say than we do. Um, so that's going to happen in the spring. And right now, we're just going to do this uh, presentation today more like a workshop. So our plan was to give brief presentations. Uh, each of us is going to present some highlights of their experience. And then uh, open the floor for discussion, for your questions and answers. So the basic idea was we try to do as fast as we can, always run late. But the basic thing is to do us kind of give you a broad idea of what we are doing uh, by each doing 10, 15 minutes of presentation. And then give you time to kind of um, get into the highlights of things that are interest to you by asking us questions. And then we get into the more in depth. Uh, so unless there is something you're really totally curious about, you have to know now, I would say kind of make a note of what you're interested in and ask us at the end so that we run fast and we get done. Um, anything else? We're good? So I get started. So the, um, the highlights I'm going to give you today is about the class I teach in mechanical engineering. It's 201 Elements of Structures. And this is the first course in Strength of Materials that is taught to students in the 2A curriculum in mechanical engineering. So these are sophomores coming in. And essentially, the class is new. It started in the fall of 2012. And we started off, I had a total clear slate, which is uh, you know, useful, kind of challenging. But you can start from scratch. And the uh, mandate for this class was to teach in a 
quarter, so only uh, seven weeks, essentially strength of material, axial loading, torsion, and bending uh, to incoming students. Um, so I started off the first time I taught it in full 2012. I taught it in the traditional way, lectures, online PSETs, PDFs, Taylor, the whole shebang. And uh, it was a lot of material to cover in these few weeks. And, the, and because it's so compressed, there were no good textbooks, and the, the challenge was a little too steep. And so we were given the opportunity to develop online content uh, to, on the MITx platform and offer it on edX. So we jumped at the opportunity, and we started using uh, the tool to develop online content for the course. So I spent the spring and summer of 2013 to develop the course uh, content online and start offering the course uh, on residential in the fall of 2013, experimenting with some of the content online, or a lot of the content online, I should say. So essentially, this course is a, um, at this point, the, all the content of the course is online. The students do not have a textbook. There are lectures, recitation, and online material. And we release a week of content at a time. Every week, we release a learning sequence, uh, problem set. Uh, we do a Quizlet. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, we release a, additional example problems. And we release very concise board notes. I mean, uh, lecture notes that are really a, a couple of pages per lecture. And that's it. That's what the students rely on. Uh, so the learning sequences are an important component of the class. Essentially, are sequences of um, videos and exercises. This class is very task-oriented. The students learn to solve problems in axial load, torsion, and bending. There is always some structures that they have to look at and figure out how it deforms, what forces are inside, and these kind of things that mechanicians are interested in. So it's really important for the students to have good examples of how to approach the problems. So a lot of the learning sequences are really a presentation of what good practitioners do when they approach a problem. And because different students learn in different ways, we present these approaches through videos. Uh, we present these approaches to interactive problems. The MITx platform allows us to have the students try the problem themselves and then reveal the solution that the expert does. So we spend a lot of time doing very detailed expert solution to many exercises. And then after they had this kind of practice, they do their own problem set, which is also interactive. They have immediate feedback. And as soon as they get the right answer, immediately they see the detailed expert solution just to match their own thinking and go forward in the problem. And we also embedded a lot of tools to help them uh, not be bogged down by algebra, but really focus on the content on the class. So we have MATLAB embedded, minimal uh, energy barrier to use numerical tools instead of having to do a lot of algebra, pen, and paper, and really focus on the content we are trying to teach them. So we do all this. And then to make sure that the students stay on top of the material, every week in class we do a Quizlet. So, a quiz, so essentially, we do a week of content. The uh, PSAT is due on Thursday. All the solutions are revealed on Thursday. And the next Monday, the students come to recitation, pen and paper, 15 minutes. And they have to solve exactly one of those problems, one of the PSAT or learning sequence. Not similar, but exactly one of those. And this changed a lot of the dynamics of the course, because the students uh, are not stupid. They know I have the solution <laughs> to these problems. One of these problems will be I'll be tested on one of these. And it's worth 25% of my grade. And so the students learn this content. So it's not like they just do the PSAT or they copy the PSAT or they try to understand what the learning sequence is, but not really in depth. They really understand it and they stay on top of the material very well. And then uh, the other uh, trick that we use is we use a lot of uh, because we cover so much content, we try to stress as much as we, sa we can uh, similar structures in equations, in solution strategies, between the different content of the class. As we go from axial loading to torsion, we show similarities between the equations so that the students, as they learn the new material, they reactivate the material they learned in the previous uh, segment, and they draw comparison. And that allows them to proceed faster, in my experience, than what they were used to without all this uh, support, the structure support. Um, so the other thing that by having all this online content, um, the other benefit of having all this online content is that I am finally free of the classroom clock. Uh, if you have a course in which you are trying to teach something and you do not have the perfect textbook, you always feel like you have to, in the class, impart as much knowledge as possible. And you feel like unless you put it in that amount of time, that's it. You're done. They never get it. And 
by having the online version of things allows me to take more time in class. So I do a lot of um, simple demonstration with everyday kind of things that, to kind of connect the equations that we study with everyday life. And that really helps the student to connect. And uh, the online content also allows us to uh, go in depth in other things that we would not have access to, like simulations of more complex structures. And then finally, we solidify all the knowledge that the student acquired by having them do capstone kind of problems in which we bring together a more complex problem, all the different components that they learn in more simple tasks and more simple problems. And um, the students are really appreciative of all the material that we make available for them to learn. So I run surveys at the end of the course uh, on what are the components that really help you learn. And in general, the feedback are very positive. So I cleaned up the questions because it was too much wordy. But essentially, this is uh, evaluation of things that contributed to their learning. And the uh, things that PISA said, especially with the instant feedback, is critical for them because Unlike the PSAT in which you give the PSAT this week, uh, I grade it this other week, and I give it back two weeks later. And you never know what did you do wrong, if you ever even go back to figure out what was wrong. In this way, they immediately know what was wrong, and they try to correct it. So the PSAT helps them. The video of the lectures helps them, the lecture notes. In particular, the interactive practice problem, everybody remarks that that's the thing that helps them more to learn. And the quizlets help because they, learn them, they help them stay on pace. And the MATLAB, the embedded MATLAB, when we started off, uh, we were not really optimizing how well embedded it was from the very beginning. So in the beginning, students were a little resistant to the MATLAB, not a lot, but it was more work. They didn't like it. And we kept refining it. And this is the spring 15, and they start liking the MATLAB component as well. So we kind of look at the feedback of the students, and we are more or less a steady state, making sure that everything we give them is useful. We don't give them anything that they feel like it's extra, because the time is tight, and that's the time they have. Uh, so this is a lot of blah blah on the board from open, <laughs> open. Uh, it's mainly for me to remember what I have to tell you, because it's so much stuff. So the feedback for the Quizlet is good. Even if it's more scary, you have a test every week, they help them stay on board. The, these are comments from the first time I taught the class in the residential way. And these are just some, some of them. But mainly, the main problem is that they uh, felt that they did not have enough exercises and time to solidify what they learned in practice. And they felt that they, a lot of time, my lectures were rushed at the end. As I was saying, I was trying to fight the clock to get the stuff in. And um, in general, not enough time to solve problems or understand. And then I did an experiment in fall of 2013, uh, in which I flipped, totally flipped, a part of the content, a third of the class totally flipped. I did not do any lecture. I just uh, assigned videos online, and I did exercises in class. And the feedback was mixed. There were a lot of students that felt that uh, the videos were not a good substitute for uh, uh, in-person lecturing. And these are, you know, these are sophomore. Sorry, these are uh, yeah, fall sophomore and some sp some freshmen in the spring. Uh, so they do not have a lot of yet MIT uh, mechanism in place. So they may not have the discipline to actually look at all the online lectures. So I felt that for this class, because it's an introductory course, all the things that I think is really important, I do it in lecture, and I use only the online videos for prerequisites and for extensions. So I don't do any more in entirely flip content. I only flip the parts that I think are not critical for their understanding. And they, at this point, we are more or less a steady state. Their feedback from the blended learning is generally very positive. They very much like the even simple in-class demos with like a, you know, a piece of a rubber a beam or a balloon or a, a slingshot, whatever it is. It brings them back. It brings home the message. It helps them a lot. And uh, they find that the MIT X material is very helpful there. Uh, the online videos are helpful. And mainly, they like the interactive solving and the expert solutions online. Uh, the thing that I'm more interested as an educator is how well this impact their understanding of the content. So they, um, I do not, uh, this is not a science, because this data is always muddled somehow. But 
this kind of distribution of scores for a course is the typical distribution of score that I've seen for 20 years at MIT in classes. You have a very few students, 10% uh, of the students that really get everything in the course. They get a score higher than 90, cumulative on quizzes, tests, everything else. Then you have, if everything goes good, maybe half of the course over 80. Uh, and then there is the rest of the class. And this is, when I saw this thing in the traditional course, that's it. I mean, that's the normal thing. I was uh, relieved because the course was very fast. So it was good for me, actually, to see this. And this is the first time I taught with the, with the blended learning online. And it was in the fall of 2013. And at the end, when I did the grades, I had 50% of the students that had over 90 uh, totally, total score. And 87% of the class had over 80. So they did 80 out of 100 correct over the entire part of the, over the entire course. And these are data that when I saw it, I thought, there is some geniuses class, like a total, <laughs> like who are, who are these guys? Like I gave the final exam and I thought it was horrendous and I went to grade it. I'm like, done, good, good, good. Like it took me half of the time to grade it. I'm like, what's going on? Who are these guys? Some kind of Chernobyl effect or something. <laughs> I really thought that. And then what, what happened is that this thing continues semester after semester after semester. So this is my grades for this fall, just finished three weeks ago. 69 students, I had 56% over 90, 85% over 80. And this is the same person I'm teaching, the same course. The only difference is, the only difference is they have a lot of support through the online uh, components and the way we integrate everything in the course. Um, they, a lot of people ask me, okay, this is great, but how much effort do you have to put in as a faculty to develop all this? And uh, yes, there is an in the initial cost because there is the cost to think about what you're teaching, reorganize it, and bring online all the part that can be done online. And it takes effort. Uh, ODL supports this effort greatly. There are people in the digital learning lab that support faculty. And um, one of our tasks is to be connections to the family, to the family, to the faculty. This is how I feel about MIT. <laughs> Connection to the faculty and help faculty develop content to bring their own courses uh, uh, on the platform and to edX. And uh, the involvement of the faculty on the nitty gritty of the, techni of the technicality of the technology does not need to be very deep. There is a whole team that helps with that. The faculty puts in the intellectual property, puts in their, their experience and knowledge and uh, the content is created as a community effort. I couldn't have done anything without Martin sitting back there that was my TA for forever and ever to help to do this material. And actually is in the trenches to do all the work to make all these things happen. All the people at ODL, at uh, edX in the beginning, they helped us work uh, and develop this course. The benefits for the faculty is enormous. Once you have all this content on course, you can really focus on teaching best practice that you can. Uh, it's very time effective once the material is created. And you can constantly refine and improve content with very little effort. And if somebody else comes to join your teaching team, it's easy to bring them on board on everything, um, terminology, uh, conventions, everything is online. So they easy for them to join the team and develop new content, personalize the content that's online. And essentially, you create a textbook that instead of being frozen in time, is always evolving, is collaborative, and is always, you always try to address the best way to teach to your students the specific task that you have in mind. Uh, so that's my experience. In general, it was very positive, And I'm still struggling to bring it to other courses. And uh, you know, I'll welcome your question after we are done with the whole panel. Thanks a lot. Um, hi, my name is Saif Rayyan. Um, I'm a lecturer in the physics department, um, also a digital learning uh, lab scientist. And I thought uh, instead of going over um, one of the courses that we've done is to just share some of the lessons and highlights 
uh, from blended physics courses. We've been doing this, the uh, blending of MOOC content since fall 2012, so we've done a lot of courses. I love to talk about this stuff, so I could sit down and talk to you for two hours, but I don't know. I want to just focus on few lessons and highlights from all of these courses. I think a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say is really common between all of us, and I think might be also interesting to discuss um, after we all present um, our piece. Um, so uh, I, I put five of the, I think, uh, most important highlights and lessons uh, that we've learned. We've learned uh, pretty early on that MOOCs should be aligned with our residential offerings. Um, in the physics department, we're trying to experiment with the offerings across the physics curriculum, starting from the most introductory 801X and 802X, um, 801 and 802, up to advanced uh, graduate level courses. We've done, in fall 2014, we've done effective field theory, which is uh, a course that's usually taken by third or fourth year graduate students in theoretical particle physics. Um, in all the offerings that we had, we've always used the content in our residential courses in one way or another, um, in various, various sort of stages or, or um, methods of blending. Um, that goes from integrating online homework and pre-class assignments uh, and interactive activities to uh, basically running uh, mostly online courses for the, the more advanced uh, students. Um, um, the, the, and this leads into the second, my second point, my second lesson is that um, um, this really offers us the chance in the next five to ten years to expand our offerings. Um, at MIT, the goal of the students is not just to finish a series of classes. Students have a lot of goals, uh, academic goals, uh, career goals, and our, uh, the, the job of, uh, our job is really to make them reach their goals more efficiently. Um, the idea that someone has to wait for a course for, in, for two years because the, all, the course is only offered once every two years is, is simply ridiculous. Uh, um, and, and this is what we're trying to do, basically. We're trying to uh, come up with a new model of course offering where um, the lectures are replaced by interactive learning sequences. These could be videos uh, rich with checkpoint exercises. They could be tutorials. They could be other activities like uh, uh, a project that they can submit online. Homework is completely done online, and, and this is really the, the strongest point of the edX platform, and this is what we focus most of our work. I probably spend 80% of my time trying to think, how can I automate the homework in a way that, that it can be done interactively? Um, um, key presentations and interactive FaceTime. We're not eliminating uh, FaceTime with the professor completely in, in this model. We're basically keeping... Uh, um, uh, a couple of hours where the teacher and the students engage into productive conversations. Usually the students come in uh, have, having done the, some of the learning sequences, maybe started with the homework, sit down with the professor, reflect on their knowledge, and uh, ask questions about uh, the homework. We've done this for uh, more, uh, I think, the more advanced, intermediate to advanced courses as Simona did. I think for the freshmen it might not work as well, um, but the, the, uh, I think the, the junior to senior or the graduate students, the, they, they have the self-discipline to really uh, learn in more independently, so this model sort of works for them better. Uh, we've done for eight, uh, the S here is for special, you have to apply for special permission when you run a, an educational experiment like this at MIT, so we did it for quantum mechanics too. Uh, we did an additional spring offering, we usually offer eight, 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 uh, 805 in the, f in the in the fall, so this time we did it in the spring where it was mostly online uh, eliminated the lectures the way that I've, I've, I've mentioned it before. Uh, it was such a success that students loved it, the department loved it, uh, the professor thought that the students did very well, is that we're actually going to repeat the same thing. So now this might become uh, into a regular offering. Instead of offering the course once a year, we actually offer it twice, where the main section is offered during the fall, and in the spring we have a special online section um, for people who want to do it this way. Um, um, right now, we're uh, running atomic and optical physics. We're running the, the MOOC uh, on edX, and at the same time, the students at MIT and some from Harvard are taking this course for credit, where they do everything online, and they meet with uh, Wolfgang Katerle, uh, uh, who's teaching the class for two hours a week. Um, uh, we've done effective field theory in fall 2014, where the course is, th this course, for example, the, the professor, uh, Ian Stewart, he is the world expert on this topic. Uh, the course is only taught at MIT, it's not taught anywhere else in the world. Um, we put this course online on edX, um, students at MIT could take it for credit at that point. The course at MIT is only offered once every three years. 
Um, now students can actually go and do some of this work online. Um, this course is especially interesting because uh, for graduate students who are more interested in enabling them to do research. And a lot of the content in that course is focused on uh, really research topics. So people can go there, do the specific modules that contribute to the research. And I think moving forward, this is, this is going to be uh, really opening the, the, the limitations of the schedule and allowing students to learn things as, as they need them. Um, Immediate feedback is essential to blended learning. As Simona said, uh, really the, the, uh, uh, the most powerful thing about the online platforms is, is enabling uh, the immediate feedback that students get outside class and sometimes in class. Uh, and students really approve of it. Um, um, in spring 2014, uh, I worked with John Belcher on integrating uh, uh, blended content from, uh, uh, from the MOOC and during the, the semester. Um, and we asked the students about what they thought was helpful to their learning in, in 802. Uh, 80 and um, this, this was a pleasant surprise. I mean, it's, it's, we, we, sort of, we, thought that we knew that the students liked it. But when we asked them uh, how they liked the checkable answers on MIT for written piece at homeworks, 79% uh, rated as extremely uh, helpful. I'm going to just zoom on this because I've never, ever seen anything like this <laughs> in my life for MIT students. Uh, and um, uh, uh, this, these checkable answers were actually optional. We were afraid to move too fast. So we kept the homework to be uh, sort of traditional written problem sets. We, we just allowed them to check their intermediate and final answers online. And they absolutely loved it. And I think this, this also connects to uh, cognitively how they approach the problem sets. I think that doing things completely online, especially for a freshman, is very challenging. Um, uh, requiring them to actually have a written record was, was more efficient. And you know, sometimes th these surprises come up when, when you try to integrate technology. You use the technology and you think, oh, this technology is, is, is super cool. But then you realize it's actually counterproductive. So, um, um, but, but really, I mean, we've done this survey in every single course that we've used MITx since uh, spring 2014. I think this is a common across the board. We see these results all, all, all the time. When we ask the students, should 82 continue to use MITx, 95% uh, say yes. And, and again, this is the same thing that we see in all our uh, uh, other courses. When we ask them, do you think that other physics courses should, uh, could benefit from using MITx, uh, the answer is, is also overwhelmingly positive. But at the same time, uh, whenever we ask this question, the, answer, the, the percentage is a little bit less. And I feel that some people in their comments, they say that they're afraid that other courses might not implement um, this stuff effectively. Uh, I think that is the, this fear of online learning, people, students do not even like to use the term online learning because their, their image uh, of an online learning is sitting in front of their computer screen and not interacting with other people. That leads me to the fourth point is that blended learning should increase interactive engagement and should encourage good study habits. Um, this was a, a challenge when we started uh, trying to integrate blended learning components with Teal. Uh, uh, when, when I worked with, with John Belcher, I think that Teal is one of the best things that happened in uh, the teaching of freshmen in the physics department in the past 20 years. Um, and I think that it was, was really challenging for us to not impact that. Uh, John actually had, had a motto uh, uh, that he, he said, do, that our first priority is to do no harm. Uh, students sit down together and interact with each other, with the professor. They do a lot of interactive activities in class. We do not want to move them into a, a, a model where they're just sitting in front of a computer screen and not talking to everyone. So that was really a priority for us. And uh, um, I, I think the model that we implemented did not impact that negatively. We've done uh, uh, some work with, with Lori Breslau and the TLL to, to really show that uh, the way we're uh, allowing students to do homework online does not prevent them from working with each other and, and still sort of collaborate on homework. Uh, when we did 805, uh, uh, since this was more, more recent. So we actually asked, what, asked, asked students about um, how, how they approach uh, doing homework and other, uh, other things in the online course compared to other traditional courses. So we asked about working with others on the PSET, uh, finishing the PSET, uh, study the solutions of the PSETs, um, work on PSET questions in sequence, ask questions directed to professor and course staff. You can see that all of these, all, almost all of them, uh, they do more in the online course than they do uh, in, in the traditional lecture-based course. Um, 
this, this was the one that's really interesting for me because you asked, working with others on PSATs, you, you think that if the course is mostly online that people will work uh, basically more independently. And, and half of them did so. I mean, half of the students actually did more uh, work more independently. However, if you see the green bar there, it's about 25% of the students. This is a small sample, only 16 students. 25% of the students said that they actually worked much more with the students in the online format than they did with, uh, with the traditional lecture format. Um, one student actually uh, felt that they needed to explain this a little bit more. And what they said is that usually in the PSAT, when they work together, they don't, the, the, everyone is, is going into a different direction. And, and they could, sometimes they cannot converge on a correct answer. So they feel that their interaction is not being productive. But using the online platform, they could actually check their intermediate and final answers. And they eventually converge on the correct answer. So they find that it's more productive to interact with each other. Um, I'm not saying that we do everything uh, correctly, but I think this is something that we should always watch for. Uh, be always careful to uh, make sure that, that um, the, the, the online, the, the, the student behavior changes into a positive way, not a negative way. And, and I think this requires a lot of experimentation, requires that a lot of, uh, all of us share our experiences because uh, honestly, a lot of the time, we do not know how um, blended learning, the way that we implement it, will impact the student's behavior. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it might not be uh, as positive. Um, uh, then the right tools actually enable uh, better instruction for the teacher. Um, teaching in TL, um, uh, I work with, with 10 different professors, um, 10 graduate students, 60 undergraduate TAs, 600 to 800 students. There is an enormous amount of uh, in information, uh, data um, that's there that, that can be used to improve the instruction and make uh, the life of the teachers better. Um, it's like Simona said, at the beginning, it does require a lot of time investment and, and resources to get uh, this content up. But once you have it, you have really the chance to uh, enable the teachers to improve their teaching. Look at what they've done before. Um, one of the projects that we're working on is uh, LORE. It's a content library. We're working with MITx uh, Engineering to, to build this. Um, at this point, we have multiple courses that, that we've done for uh, introductory physics. And we're putting all this content online. Um, so that when uh, we decide to build our assignments for the next uh, year or so, we can actually go in and, and collect, uh, uh, look at the problems and, and build some assignments. Um, the next step in, in this content library is really to put a lot of the data that comes from the online platform. So to figure out which problems are more difficult than others, how students did on the problems. Eventually, you could even compare the student's performance from one year to another. Uh, we're very excited about this. Um, I, I tell people, um, um, uh, Peter Domashkin is, is uh, uh, a senior instructor in physics. Uh, students absolutely love him. Um, and uh, he, he works with the faculty on, on running Teal. Uh, one day, he, he actually he took me. He said, oh, um, I'm going to go look for problems. So he takes me to the basement of <laughs> one, some building around here. I, I mean, I, I didn't know which building it was. And, and he goes into this, uh, what he calls the vault. Uh, he goes into this room. And there are boxes over boxes over boxes of papers. So basically, a, a lot of problem sets, exams, uh, student uh, 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 graded material from 1970 or something like that. <laughs> it's all one place. Um, before we entered, he said, you know, cover, cover your nose, because uh, you're going to have an instantaneous uh, uh, Asthma attack, uh, <laughs> but but really we can now we can actually put this content online. My dream is to put a lot of the content that MIT faculty, MIT faculty create uh, great content year after year, and putting this online and uh, that enables us to sort of really build on it one year to another. Um, we're also building a lot of tools on uh, uh, for using in Teal. Um, we're actually running an experiment today in the Teal uh, uh, classroom where students uh, do the experiment on MIT X. And uh, this, is, um, this is the instructor view. So the instructor can open this sheet. Um, and uh, and uh, you can actually see how the students are progressing by color code. So this is, just, uh, this is a snapshot at the point when uh, these students at these tables were at page one. But as they progress, you'll see these colors uh, changing. 
So uh, Julian Bloomfield um, uh, really worked uh, on integrating a lot of little tools like this that makes the uh, interaction in the classroom more effective. Um, I think I'm going to stop here, but thanks to many, many people that th th this work really requires a lot of efforts from multiple people, and, and without them, th this would never happen. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Ellen Waltrout and I'm from the Department of Biology. So what I want to start with today is just showing you that there's a lot going on in biology, even if you only hear of the edX courses or you may not always hear all the other stories that happen. And today I'm mostly going to focus on one and a half of these stories. So, um, but really any of these could be a separate story. So just like in physics where there's a lot going on or other departments, there's a lot in biology as well. And just like physics, we try to use all of our MOOC content um, on campus as well. So our intro bio biology course, we've used that in 7012, 7013, 7014, 7016. And the professors either decide to use all of the content or some of the content, and they can customize things to what they want. Um, so 7013 has used the content for some of their own independent online problem sets, but for um, 7014, they just use some of the activities in class. And um, also at UMass Boston, Brian White is using the content in his on-campus course. We ha also have a quantitative biology course, and with that content, we have used it on campus our, um, in the outreach program because that's how it initiated it from an outreach project. We also use it in the 7S391 that we ran in 2014. We used it, all of the MOOC content in a blended learning environment with students that summer. And now we have that course open to all of, everyone at MIT. Um, if you log on to the MIT system, anyone can have access to that course for people who are in research labs and need to know this information. And our molecular biology courses, they all are used on campus as well in the residential course. But we have some projects that are not edX courses already, and we do things on campus with these courses as well. Our main project for this example would be 706 Cell Biology. I'm going to talk more about that later. Uh, we also did a course 7S390, Creating Digital Learning Materials in Biology. And so we worked with the MIT undergrads to make their own materials on the MITx platform, either video or problems that they wanted to do. And 703 Genetics, they have used the platform and the MITx site in 2014. So we have a lot of materials, but the question is, like, are we just making all of this for no reason? You know, we really want to make sure MIT students use it. And so to first show that, I want to just show you 7012 Introduction to Biology. And this is uh, the activity for the sem this semester, this year. The purple represents video events, and the orange represents problem check events. Um, so one of, there's about 500 students in the class, and one surprising thing that you may be surprised to know is that video watching is not required at all. So we have up to 3,000 clicks on the site from students in the course, and they're not required to do any of that video watching. Um, with the orange line, for some problem sets, they are required to go to the site to do one problem of their problem set, but um, only one problem of the problem set. So we also see them doing other problems on the site. They're just there for practice as well. And as you can imagine, most of these peaks align with problem set and exam deadlines. And you can see sort of in the beginning of the semester, they didn't really realize the site might be useful. And then once they got to like the end of September, they started using it. And then you can see video use is you know, throughout the course, even though um, it, even outside of exam and problem sites uh, set deadlines. So, but that's you know, as we expect. So. Um, next, I'm going to focus on the story for 706 Cell Biology. And we worked directly with the faculty, Frank Solomon and Adam Martin. 
And for this case, we wanted to really solve a problem that we were discussing with Frank during that summer, is how do we get biology students to understand experimental techniques and experimental design when they don't have experience in the lab with those techniques? And especially these advanced biology courses, they really are not doing that in the labs on campus. There are different techniques. And um, they want to be able to get the students to be able to discuss scientific papers. But how do we get them to discuss the scientific, scientific papers without the scaffolding they need to understand what the paper is discussing? So our potential solution we presented to Frank would be to give the students the option to learn this type of material through video. And luckily, we convinced him to give this a try. And our results at the end of the semester were that students approved and wanted more. And the professors saw an improvement in engagement and scientific thinking in the students. So I'll go through that a little bit more. So what we did is that we had four videos that were five to eight minute animated videos. So for this project, um, Sarah Thornton started that summer. And so when she started, we were talking about doing these videos with Frank, what would we do? And she decided that they had to be better quality. So she taught herself animation that summer. So that's pretty amazing. And she uh, knew how to do graphic design, but she really pushed herself to do that. And we also, on the website, we used an MITx site to host those videos. We posted questions that we wrote with the faculty to, um, that were directly uh, to follow the video, that were about the video. And the students could answer those questions on the discussion forum. Frank also started using mud slips. So that's where students write the muddiest point of the lecture at the end of the class if they have a question or something. He would go through those with the TAs, and the next class he would discuss one of those, the most popular one. But he would also post answers to the others on the discussion forum. And we collected data through the MITx site and surveys. And what you should also know is that all the material on the MITx site is just voluntary. It's optional. There was no point assigned to any of the material on the site. All right. Okay, so what I'll do now is just play a clip of the video so you get a sense of what these For look example, like. For example, when we study signaling pathways, we want spatial information. Where is this enzyme? Where is its substrate? And we want temporal information. When does the enzyme act on its substrate? If you fix the cell to preserve geometry for microscopy, you lose the ability to assay molecules. If you open the cell to assay the enzyme in the substrate, you lose the spatial information. This video presents a neat way to address such questions. First, we'll briefly review some science from class. We discussed how phosphoinositides, for example, PIP3, serve as second messengers for many signals involved in cell survival, organization, and proliferation. PIP3 is the product of the reaction catalyzed by phosphoinositol 3 kinase, or PI3K. Upstream, it is the binding of extracellular signals to the receptors that activates the PI3 kinase. What is downstream of the PI3 kinase and of PIP3? Here is the current model for one of the downstream effectors of this pathway. One of the enzymes activated by this pathway is the protein kinase AKT. AKT has... All right. So you get the idea of what the videos are like and how they're directly tied to the class that was the material that was in content in class as well as the material that it's setting things up for the research that was in a scientific paper. All right. And what we found when we started doing this video project is uh, at the end of the semester, looking at all of the views, is that almost 100% of the students watched all of these videos that we posted for the course. So we have the MITx click data just showing that everyone has clicked uh, in the video, but also just by the survey data, the students reported, uh, about half the students that did the survey did report that they watched the video as well. And we also saw in the click data that students clicked more than just once as well. Um, and then in the survey data, we had a lot of positive comments from students. So for example, this student said, these videos and the discussion questions help a lot. I feel like I'm actually coming away with an understanding of the experiments and an improved ability to think about experimental design, controls, and how results can be interpreted. 
We also asked the faculty to, you know, about what their experiences were. And Professor Adam Martin said, the goal of our course is not only to get students to understand how a cell thinks, but to also understand how a cell biologist thinks. After using the videos on the MITx site, I noticed a big difference in the students' ability and willingness to suggest experiments that address the cell biological problem in lecture. They were thinking like cell biologists. So we also asked the students on the survey if they found the videos useful and the discussion forum useful. And for both cases, the majority of the students found the, the materials very useful as a study aid. And similar to what Safe uh, had in his surveys where we asked if he wanted another MITx site, if he wanted these videos and another course, the majority of students also said yes to that for our biology courses. So this year, we've added two additional need experiments videos to the course. Um, Professor Martin has also adopted using mud slips in that practice since he, when we looked at the data, we saw that this, even if the students weren't posting, a lot of people were using the forum to read and study. And now the course only uses an MITx site. They don't have a separate Stellar site as well. And if you look at the data for this semester so far, um, you can see that there's only about 100 students in this class. Purple is video and the black line is discussion forum. And you can see the numbers are, we're not getting thousands of views because there's fewer students and we have a lot fewer videos in this course. So we only have about seven videos versus the other course, we probably have 150 video segments in the other course. But you can see that there is a regular pattern of use throughout the semester where it does go up to 200 or so uh, events here and what's interesting is that there's every day there's class they're sort of going to the site and looking at video or looking at the discussion forum and then of course when we have exams the students are there uh, heavily looking at the video or the discussion forum and given that there's only 700 100 students in the class having over 750 events means that they're watching it multiple times or they're pausing in the video and like going back and reviewing things that way and we can't really separate that out right now, but we do know from other uh, information that the people are watching to 95% completion or more, at least the majority of students, almost everyone, 80, 90 students. So um, I just didn't show that graph as well. So with that, um, that story should hopefully be available online soon and we can share that more. But I want to thank the faculty, Frank Solomon and Adam Martin. Uh, of course, the MITx biology team. So Sarah is a postdoc who did the, the work with me on this project and especially did all of the animation, except for one video that our Europe Sari Riley has done, and she's also here today. So um, she is amazing, too, with her animation skills. And uh, we have all these other projects going on that Nathaniel, who's a postdoc, um, Teresa, who just graduated, she helped out some as a grad student, and now she's officially a postdoc. But, and Megan Warner, who just help, they, she helps out when she has time as a, as a grad student in some of these projects. And thank you to the ODL and the Department of Biology. And you should find us on Twitter and on YouTube and Facebook. And if you go to YouTube, you can see some of the other videos that we created, too, from Sari that are there and some from Sarah. All right, thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Jessica Sandland. I am a technical instructor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and I am the last of the MITx digital learning scientists that you're going to be hearing from today. Um, so I just wanted to give you a really brief overview. Um, like all of my colleagues, there are a lot of activities that are taking place in, um, in my department, uh, some of which I'm involved in and some of which I'm not. Um, I have, you know, sort of cata cataloged up here mostly the ones that we have actually had edX offerings for. But I will point out that there are several smaller scale initiatives that are also going on in our department that make use of the MITx platform for blended le learning, generally at a little bit of a smaller scale. And today I would like to focus, um, <coughs> pardon me, I would like to focus my talk to you on really two uh, courses one of which is 3086X, uh, or 3086 on campus, Innovation and Commercialization, and the other is 3032X, Mechanical Behavior of Materials. 
And I chose to talk to you guys today about these two classes. First of all, because I think they're very different classes. And I think that, that the fact that they are such different classes uh, helps to illustrate um, some of the power, perhaps, of, of blended learning here on campus. And the other reason I choose to talk about these classes is the fact that um, we have been working on them for a number of years now, and I think we have a lot of lessons to share from them. So I'm going to start with 3086. Um, this is an elective subject. It's taken mostly by undergraduate juniors and seniors, um, although it is also sometimes taken with a different course number by our uh, graduate students as well. It's taught by Professor Jean Fitzgerald. And really, this, the, 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 the course centers on a course project that is designed to really help students understand the fundamental processes involved in innovation. Um, so instead of you know, course, the course really being centered on problem sets or being centered on the lectures, these students take a project and throughout the course of the semester, they develop this project, they work on this project, and they choose this project themselves so that they can work either alone or in groups on something that really matters to them. And the goal is to really provide a collaborative, project-based learning experience for the students in the class. Um, one of the consequences of this sort of project-based class is that the students really have to very quickly learn how to conduct a lot of in-depth research, uh, sometimes in areas where they're not particularly comfortable. So they need to come up to speed on conducting technical literature reviews, which most of them are pretty comfortable with because they're, you know, they're scientists but also searching SEC reports to find out financial information about companies or searching patent uh, databases to learn more about the patent landscape of their innovative idea. So we have incorporated online learning in this class in, in three basic ways. Um, we have online lecture videos of our professor you know, talking about the course material. Um, students watch this outside of, uh, outside of class, and this serves, you know, first of all, to give the students some flexibility, um, but also to really open up class periods for more, for more interaction with the teaching staff. Um, so there's more time for discussion. There's more time to invite in outside lecturers um, other than the teaching staff themselves to try to give some additional perspective, you know, new perspectives on this material to the class. The second thing we have is we have some online exercises that are done on the uh, MITx platform. Um, and these exercises have definitely evolved through the years. We've been offering this class, I think, for probably about two and a half years now. Um, and at this point, the goal of these exercises is, is to really help get students up to speed with those research questions that I was talking about you, uh, talking with you about just a few minutes ago. Um, we want to give students some practice. Before they get to their real, their big projects, we want to give them some small practice that's going to teach them how to, one, define good research questions, identify what they're trying to figure out. And two, we want to give them some support identifying um, good sources and utilizing those good sources to answer the questions that are going to be really fundamental when they're talking about their own innovative work. And then the third thing that we've done, uh, and this is outside, at this point, this is this outside of the MITx platform. Um, this course also uses some project development uh, software that facilitates the, the, the development of these student projects. And this software allows students to keep detailed records of their work. It allows them to record their thoughts. It allows them to sort of keep track of their developments and the evolution in their project. Perhaps they want to you know, identify some question that they think is important. It allows them a place to put the answers they find. It gives them a place to identify questions that they need to answer in order to move their projects forward. Um, we also find that the project software helps to enable student-student interaction. So when the students are collaborating on their projects, they can communicate a little bit more efficient, efficiently. And our faculty find that um, they're getting a lot more insight into the students' projects. They're getting a lot um, better, they're getting a better idea of sort of the processes that are going on in the students' you know, in the students' heads and in the students' project development. And that allows them to really 
be better mentors to the students. It facilitates this mentorship. And the students in 3086 spend a fair amount of time working either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with you know, a faculty to help them and to support them in the development of their project. And our faculty find that this project software helps enable that. So one of the questions you know, we wanted to ask, we wanted to understand how well some of these tools were really working for our students. And so here, I'm not, this is, there's a lot of data here and I could, I could talk for, for quite some time to this slide and I'm not going to because I have 10 or 15 minutes and I've already used most of them. But in 2014, uh, we had no, we're very, very limited project software in 2015. Uh, we expanded this a great deal. And we identified a whole bunch of different metrics, things that the faculty really wanted to see demonstrated in the projects. And we went through all of the 2014 projects. We went through all of the 2015 projects. And almost to a metric, I think there's one exception here, um, we saw that more and more and more of the projects were demonstrating these particular outcomes that our faculty were looking for. Now, what were these, you know, what were these sort of metrics? Um, I'm not going to, um, you know, talk to all of them. I think the most important part is that they're really specific, you know, specific in this case to the course, specific to what the faculty wants to see coming out of the student projects. But to give you a few examples, um, our faculty believe that it's really important that the students incorporate intellectual property information into their innovation projects. So that's one of the things we looked for. Um, another thing we looked for was teams identifying industry structure information that pertains to their innovative idea. Another thing that we looked for was whether or not the students had identified when they're talking about their innovations who might actually purchase their innovation and why they might purchase their innovation. So these are sort of just examples and the others are very much in this vein of the kind of outcomes we're looking for. <coughs> Pardon me. And, um, we also just sort of qualitatively, the, instruct the instructors were observing that when they added this, this kind of um, record keeping software for their students, they were feeling that they were seeing much higher uh, performance out of the students in their project developments. So now I want to contrast this to another course that's um, quite different, but I think also has some very, very exciting outcomes that we're seeing. Uh, 3032, Mechanical Behavior of Materials, um, this is a core material science elective. All of the material scientists, all the materials science and engineering students are required to take 3032. Um, and it's the only core course that they take that is devoted to the mechanical behavior of materials. So it's really essential that the students learn, you know, really a large amount of information in this one class. Um, the thing that I very much have enjoyed about the development of 3032X is that we decided to do it essentially all with very standard tools that are available on the, um, on, on the edX Studio platform. We didn't move outside of that at all. Um, I think that there are a lot of creativity and a lot of thought went into exactly how we were going to use those tools. Um, but we, did, we, we stayed you know, quite strongly on the, the, the standard path, if you will. And we provided the students with a whole bunch of resources, filmed lectures, screencast examples. Uh, we filmed some demos. There were online problem sets. Our professor, Professor Lorna Gibson teaches this course. She developed and is in the process of still developing some really great um, short feature videos where she takes students on you know, small field trips and things like that to explain some interesting, <coughs> excuse me, um, some interesting elements of her course. So the first time this course um, was offered after you know, the MOOC had been developed was in fall of 2014. Um, and this time through, through, we used it essentially as supplementary information. The professor, she continued to give her lectures and she provided the online site for students who might miss a class or for students who might have a class conflict. They were, they were, there were videos there, they could access them at will, but they weren't required to. The professor continued to give her lectures, she continued to teach it as she always would. Um, again, with the problem sets, they were available for practice, but none of this was required. And um, the students were very, very positive about this. And there, Professor Gibson made what I thought was a really interesting observation here. 
um, she found that of the top five students in her class, three of them didn't attend lectures. Three of them were simply following the class in the online environment, despite the fact you know, that really wasn't how her class was structured. Um, but I think the fact that she was seeing such, you know, such, a dramatic, um, such a dramatic effect with those three students, it made her think that perhaps it was time to see if we, if we could do a, really, a fully flipped classroom. And so this semester, Professor Gibson elected to fully flip her classroom. Um, <coughs> now, in this case, our professor's conducting tutorials, um, discussion, you know, where there are discussions, where there is problem solving, where there is lots of interaction between the professor and the students. Uh, the TA conducts a review session. The students also do laboratory work, which they've always been uh, doing in this particular course. Uh, they do their problem sets online where they receive immediate feedback. And then there are short homework quizzes. See, we, we've mentioned that we're, we're sort of a community here. And I believe Simona began giving her students quizlets. And she talked to Professor Gibson. And Professor Gibson loved the idea. And now Professor Gibson is giving quizlets uh, every Friday. They're taken directly from the homework uh, to make sure that the students are, are keeping up. And in general, the students are doing quite well. Um, on them. And as I think a number of my colleagues have mentioned, this really serves to keep the lectures, the feedback, the problem sets, all of the work in sync. You don't have to wait two weeks to get a response, you know, get a graded uh, problem set from your TA and you've already forgotten the material. Everything is happening at once now. So we asked the students what they thought, and I think these sort of uh, results will look pretty familiar. Um, we asked them if they preferred a traditional or flipped class on a scale of one, you know, is traditional and seven is flipped. Um, we found that we got a score, a mean score there of 5.78. So in general, they were much preferring the flipped class. As Safe pointed out, um, the students, in a way that you almost never see, really, really, really like the instantaneous feedback that they're getting on these problem sets. This is very popular. I've, I don't think I've ever seen a, uh, uh, you know, review numbers like that. And they felt that they were learning better this way as well. And then one of the questions that we thought was really important to ask them, because we're always very nervous, um, you know, do the students feel like they're missing out? Do they feel like they're not getting enough contact with the professors? So we asked them, well, do you feel like, this is, this is a mid-semester survey, by the way, do you feel like you're getting sufficient con contact time with your professor? Um, and again, on a scale of one to seven, we found a score of 5.5. The students in general agree that they are, in fact, getting sufficient time uh, with their professor in this course. So that was really encouraging to us, because I think that was one of the things we're most worried about. So my time is almost up. Um, uh, I have just talked to you today about two courses that I think are you know, both successful and both very different. And um, they encourage me, because I think that they lead me to believe that we can really develop uh, successful blending learning experiences for a wide variety of classes, provided that you know our course development strategy really uh, you know reflects the specific needs of the courses that we're developing. So I thank you all for your time. So what happens next? So we have about ten minutes to um, do some Q and A. And uh, I thought maybe if we really are concise with our time, we'll have each one of these um, folks a chance to maybe address and answer and, and talk. And I was wondering, Simone, do you want to call on the first person? <laughs> OK. OK, so. I'm wondering if you guys have thought at all about uh, crowdsourced content on online classes. Uh, in other words, student contributed content that other students can see, as opposed to you know, relying on faculty to convert their whole class. It takes a lot of work for faculty to do that. Um, you know, can students contribute to something like, a, um, you know, like an online Q&A environment or that kind of thing? Haven't you done some crowdsourcing? Uh, who wants to take that? <laughs> Thanks, Monica. So I think in terms of crowdsourcing, the, experiment, the experiments we have done are um, experiments in uh, giving hints to problems. So for instance, if you are trying to solve the problems and you get the wrong answer, uh, then you correct it. 
and you get the right answer, you have a chance to submit a hint for other students that may also submit the same answer. So that, you know, it may be something simple like check your convention for size, or it may be something more in depth, but we experimented with that in the MOOC version of the course, and it was really interesting, the results. The students actually did take the time to uh, provide suggestion to other fellow students and uh, help the community with uh, suggestions. Everybody was very positive on, on the implementation of this. It takes resources, a special server to do this kind of thing, so we have not repeated it so far, but I thought it was a successful experiment. The other thing that we did is we asked students to uh, write problems. So for, this is again for the MOOC. I asked students in the forum, get a chance to be the professor. If, why don't you uh, write a problem based on what you've learned so far in the course that you think we could uh, then implement on the platform and uh, use for uh, you know successive runs of the course. And uh, I did use a couple of those. So the students did submit uh, some ideas on uh, uh, you know, uh, problems and tasks that they could do that, you know, totally out of their generosity and their time. So it was successful. Uh, within MIT, considering the time constraints that our students have, um, I think it would be the exception that people take the time to actually contribute to the course. But maybe in a less uh, pressured environment, that would be more successful. So maybe this is more for the online community. You have more students, more people that do it with a little more leisure time than, than within the MIT community. I do not know. So I think there's several opportunities for MIT students to be involved. So one way is just on the discussion forum within your class. You can have conversations and do whatever you, the students need to do uh, in that space. They're, it's open to anything. Um, the other place is like with our Europe. So she's making videos that are used by courses and they're going to be incorporated into edX courses or residential. So if students are interested, they can be trained to do any of this and just participate on one of our teams. And then uh, we also did the course where we taught students how to create digital learning materials. And in that case, we had about 12, 15 students involved and they all made a product that you know could be used in some way. In some cases, they went on a TA or something and they used the video or they used the product. And other places, we could just post it for the public. So there's many opportunities. And I will just add very quickly that if, I, I don't know about my colleagues, but I know certainly in my department, we usually have far more spots for students who are interested in working on these things than we actually have students who are available. So I definitely <coughs> encourage you, if you're interested, to approach the people in your department who are working on these problems. Safe, so do you want to call the next person? <laughs> What? You, you can do well. the next one. Did it well? I'll do okay. the next one. <laughs> oh, okay. Call on someone. Choose someone. Uh, Point. Okay. Uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, it's a two-part question. So I'm helping a professor create a class uh, on sustainable energy online, and there's a lot of um, a lot of the issues don't have really straight answers. Um, so my question to the panel is. How do you, because I've, I've heard from the biology and also from the materials engineering and also uh, different uh, talks that you're t trying to teach them critical thinking. So the two-part question is, A, what tools in edX do you use to uh, teach them critical thinking? So it's, it's not an answer where there's a yes, no, what is the mo moment or something like that. That's one. And two, how do you come up with metrics so you can make sure that you're actually measuring critical thinking? Yeah, yeah, that um, sense. I think this is really difficult for us. I think from our experience, we try to um, reserve the most challenging tasks, which is getting people to discuss and, and work interactively to address critical thinking. Um, so we actually think that we the, 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 the most challenging stuff should be done in class, which is building these critical thinking skills, for example. And online, uh, we try to provide sort of the, the necessary background that enables us to do um, that thing. Um, I, I think that the discussion tools online are still, uh, they still have to grow uh, to, to be sort of good enough to build that kind of interaction that, that produces such skills. 
Um, but I mean, you can. Uh, we have we're starting to experiment with this stuff, but I don't think that we have a lot of good things. Uh, uh, in general, for the flipped classroom, I think introducing the ideas before class, so that people can come in and discuss them in class, that that seemed to me to be a very powerful thing. Um, and I think you can implement it in this course. That would be the easiest thing that I would recommend. Fortunately, we have, oh, you want to just say a few words, yeah. sure. Well, you were asking about tools, and there are a lot of tools that you can use that are more open-ended. And so you have to be super creative in the uh, creation of the assessment, because it, at, at a tool, when you look at it like at first glance, it may not be that uh, testing critical thinking. But for us, we use drag and drop a lot because it's an open slate. It can be anything. And so we have students um, create what data would look like because it's just a picture on other pictures. And so we have that. We have other tools that are biology specific that other people have created in software and that we've embedded in the MITx platform. So any type of tool that you know in that way. And so measuring if you're te if you're really getting critical thinking or not is much more difficult because you have to design an experiment to measure that and even just in a traditional classroom that's really hard to measure but the tools and and everything else comes from your creativity and designing the assessment do you want to say anything or jessica to add to that or? um I guess if I, I certainly could a little bit anyway I very much agree with what Mary Ellen has said and I think the question uh, it, it's sort of a two-part question uh, because it's a very different question if you're working in a purely MOOC environment where things are I think particularly difficult than when you're working in a blended environment where you can certainly resort to any of the you know any of the sort of standard traditional uh, tricks that professors have used through the years to get their students engaged in critical thinking um, we do have in a purely MOOC environment one of the one of the um, uh, techniques that edX provides to us is the ability to have uh, do peer assessments and you know students can write short answers students can write essays students can expand on things um, so those sort of tools are there as well um, but I think if we're sticking to you know blended learning I think maybe the the real the real critical question you have to be asking is what should be done online and what should be done in the classroom. Thank you. We're kind of running out of time, um, unfortunately. But I'm wondering, are you able to stay after a little bit and just talk casually with people? Do you, that's great. Um, so thank you all for coming. And please, a warm welcome for these four uh, scientists who gave us our time.